Do you need an account or something, do you? You do. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go with our continuation of yesterday's lesson, and we are looking at um, features of volcanic eruptions. Make sure I get my paper in the right spot. So features of volcanic eruptions. So yesterday we looked at fumarolic, no, not fumarolic, effusive eruptions. And we're sort of, um, fumarolic and effusive segue really nicely into each other. So we wanna talk about fumarolic eruptions. We're joined today by a special guest, Mr. Lombardi. Say hello, Mr. Lombardi. Hello, year 12, what are we? Earth class. Earth, Earth class. Science. Hello, I'm gonna put my fingers out there. Say hello, just a I little bit of- put those the... fingers somewhere yeah, else, okay. <laughs> Sorry, too close. <laughs> Okay, so fumarolic eruption or any fumarolic activity in a volcano is gas activity. Okay, any gas, anything that exists as a vapor. So for us, the segue that's really nice is gas in, in lava and magma. Now you'll notice on the PowerPoint that you should be still sort of following that the next part we move on to is vesicles. And vesicles are features caused by gas. Vesicles are features in, um, in, in lava where the gas has escaped and left holes. Um, so gas is always present in magma, but it's normally dissolved. So gas is always present magma, but it's dissolved. And just like Coke or any other sort of fizzy drink, if you think about a fizzy drink, it's basically water with carbon dioxide added into it and that carbon dioxide dissolves into the liquid. Well. The gases in magma escape when that magma becomes lava. So as soon as that magma is exposed to the outer atmosphere, the gas comes out of dissolution and forms bubbles. And what do we call that? Well, we call that effervescence. Effervescence is Latin, which is Latin to, to boil. What's Italian for boil? Mr. Lombardi? Oh, good question. Now I need to think. Sorry, sir. No, you put me on the spot. <laughs> let me get back to you. <laughs> okay, so let me write that down. When the gas or magma, I should say the magma, is exposed to the surface, it comes out of, it comes out of that dissolution, out of that solution. It forms bubbles. Brochure is the Italian for heat, so I'm heading that way. Okay, all right, okay. Um, we call that effervescence. Would you use effervescence in a term about magma? Probably not. But when you think about effervescence, you think about you take off the lid of a drink, soft drink, and the gas bubbles fizz everywhere. So the same thing happens now. If you can imagine now with our two types of magma or two types of lava. So we have our basaltic, our, our more, sorry, our less viscous lava, which is quite runny. The gas bubbles obviously are gonna be able to pop out of there very easily. But however, with our more felsic lava and magma, it's gonna mean that it, the, uh, the gas bubbles aren't going to escape as easily. So they build up in pressure and when those bubbles, when those gas escapes, it escapes in a very violent and forceful way. So let me write that down. Mafic magma. And when we think mafic magma, automatically you want to go straight to a hotspot volcano or you want to go to a divergent volcano. Um, escapes, gas escapes easily. With our felsic magma. builds up pressure and causes explosions.
so explosive activity. Jade, sorry to put you on the spot, but what do we call explosive activity in a volcano? Pyro. Close, pyro. Pyro. Paroxysmal? Paroxysmal activity. All right, good. When we think of explosive activity, we're gonna, let's try and name some volcanoes and we're gonna go with a volcano called Mount St. Helens erupted in 1985? Yeah, I think 1985. Is that right, Jay? Oh, bugger, 1980, oh no. And it's on YouTube too. Can I mention one? Please, sir. Mount Vesuvius in Naples. Absolutely. Now, Vesuvio is a typical of a felsic volcano or actually an andesitic so it's um they've got a very um it's, it's actually a lot of pressure builds up and that volcano the main reason is because we have a subduction zone moving under italy and that's producing a very slow cooling magma which again builds up as as a as a felsic or intermediate lava so the act the the type of volcanic activity we get at vesuvio um, is again a lot of paroxysmal violent activity and we'll talk more about those um, ex those explosive paroxysmal activity in a bit um, but yes Vesuvius definitely Mount Helens Mount Pinatubo 1991 Vesuvius last erupted in 1954 but I was wrong about St. Helens, so it might be 52 for Vesuvius. Um, Vesuvius is prone, it's actually due to erupt now. It should be erupting as of now. And if you go there, I went there two years ago, and when you go to the top of Vesuvio, it smells like rotten eggs. Why do you think it smells like rotten eggs? Yes, the release of sulfur, excellent. Now in a gas form, that sulfur is in the form of SO2, sulfur dioxide. Now we'll talk about the gases in a minute that are released, but sulfur dioxide is actually quite unique. It does something very, well, not good for the atmosphere, but it changes the atmosphere in a way that you might not realize just yet. So let's move on and let's look at Mount St. Helens. And I'm gonna draw a series of diagrams and they're not very good, but they're relevant to the diagrams that you guys have in, um, in your PowerPoint. So I'm gonna draw four diagrams. Here's what Mount St. Helens looked like before its eruption. We had a huge lava dome that had built up. A lava dome is something featuring for felsic volcanoes, which you remember from our last lesson. Within Mount St. Helens, there was a magma chamber that was building up inside. So magma inside, and there was a lava dome building up on the top. Just um, in the moments before Mount St. Helens erupted, there started to be, um, the, the lava dome was building up. Magma, more and more magma was pushing in to, to, into the inside of the volcano and it was making the mountain bulge bigger and bigger. So it was getting bigger. I'll try and do that. So this caused instability in the ground around the outside of St. Helens. The next day for St. Helens is we started to have a mass landslide and what's called mass wasting. And a huge chunk of the side of Mount St. Helens actually started to break away and slide down the mountain. When it did, it exposed the magma chamber to the atmosphere. You can imagine the magma chambers here and all of a sudden, I'll just leave those there if you can see. So we've got one, two, three, four. The, the ground started to fault, and then this all slid down the side of the mountain. Let's go to five. Our next stage was that as this fell down the side of the mountain, the magma chamber inside exposed all of this magma to the atmosphere. Now remember when we open up a bottle of Coke and sometimes it spurts out everywhere. 
Well, the same thing happened with Mount St. Helens. When all of the dirt fell down the side of the mountain and the, ma and the magma chamber was exposed to the atmosphere, all of that gas then tried to be released at once. When it did, it caused a massive pyroclastic flow or surge. So we can imagine here all of this magma, and I'm not talking about lava or rock, I'm talking about molten magma underground. It's exposed to the air. All of a sudden, the air bubbles burst out and all of the material instantly cools and is pushed out at very, very high velocity. Um, at a high velocity, a thousand kilometers an hour. Very, very fast. So what happened is, is it forced this massive explosion outwards and actually upwards. It literally blew the volcano apart. So when you look at Mount St. Helens now, it looks sort of like this down here. But the interesting story about Mount St. Helens now is that magma is now starting to build up again in the middle. And our magma chamber is starting to slowly fill up again. And what we end up getting is we're actually getting the formation of a new lava dome in the middle of Mount St. Helens now. It's only tiny, and it's probably gonna be another thousand years before Mount St. Helens erupts like that again. But that release of gas, that built up pressure, was so much that it killed a lot of people and destroyed thousands and thousands of kilometers um, of, of timber and woodlands. And if you look at the PowerPoint I sent, Ali, would you mind just skipping forward? So you can see the first the before and after, then you can see a first picture of the bulge, then we've got the ash um, falling out, and then obviously we've got the further eruption. Can you go into the next slide? There you can see some of the trees that were blasted. And if you look at the distance of the mountain, of how far it is away in that tree where it's all splintered, um, you can actually get an indication of the power of that volcanic eruption. The volcano there, and I'm just estimating, is about two, maybe three kilometers from that tree. So the, power, the, the, the destructiveness of the explosion was enough to cause that amount of damage from a very long way away. Ali, would you mind going to the next slide? Okay, um, then we can see, ah oh yeah, what's actually, what you're looking at here with this next, you can see a, a sort of yellow and brown and red map. And the volcano is sort of in the middle. Um, there's a little white mark to show where the volcano was and there you've got some mud flow deposits. But if you look at that actual, the devastation of that eruption, it's all on one side. It is everything to the north of, of the, the actual volcano, whereas nothing to the south was destroyed at all. Why? Not because, not because the magma, everything was pushing upwards, but rather it was pushed out because of that buildup and that release of fumarolic pressure. Cool. All right. So, what gases? What gases? So, the gases that we have that are released by volcanoes are our favourites. Water vapour. Mostly, um, volcanoes release water vapour, and they've been doing that since the dawn of time. If you want to wonder where all of our oceans have come from, it's all come from water that was outgassed by volcanoes back about four billion years ago. So all of our water originally comes from volcanoes, not from space, not from aliens, maybe a little bit by comets, but mostly from within the Earth itself. And volcanoes still pump out lots and lots of water vapour. They also pump out a lot of CO2, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, SO2. Don't worry about the spelling too much. Oh, Mr. Lombardi almost fell over there. Sorry, you all right there, sir? And then the next is hydrofluoric acid. And there's a lot of fluorines and there's a lot of, I guess, um, halides and noble gases that are also released by volcanic eruptions, but they're only in trace amounts. All right, so uh, let's talk about one of these gases here, carbon dioxide, and let's go to Cameroon. I've never been to Cameroon. I've been to Africa, but I've never been to Cameroon. Now, Cameroon is, is um, 
obviously it's in Africa. What type of volcanoes, or what type of tectonic activity do we have in, in Africa, Tom? Um, divergent. Oh, good man, divergent. Caused along what, what major landscape feature? Yeah, the East African Rift, Rift Valley. And in Cameroon, there is a volcano there and it's called Lake Nios. I actually don't know the name of the volcano. I think it's just called Lake Nios Volcano. Anyway, um, I don't have a year for you. I can't remember the year. I think it was back in the 80s. I'm so sorry I don't have a year for you for Lake Nios, but That, that's okay. Um, but uh, at their last eruption, well, it actually wasn't an eruption, Lake Nios released a, a flow of carbon dioxide gas. So there was a fumarolic eruption. Of CO2 gas. Carbon dioxide gas, this is, this is quite amazing what happened. Let's say the volcano is sort of like this and there's this big lake on the top called Lake Nios. Well, carbon dioxide was released and flowed down the side of the volcano. When it flowed down the side of the volcano, it flowed over a village and it killed 1,746 people. Killed them on the spot and they didn't even know they were dying. They were in their villages, they were, um, they were just going about normal daily life. And 250,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide flowed down the side of the volcano. Down that side of the volcano. It was a real tragedy and people didn't know, know exactly what killed them. The people were sitting there, um, they were lying down, or they were working and they died on the spot. There was nothing to actually show, there were no wounds on them, there was nothing really on them that, that you know, you, they just simply died where they were. And that's because they simply died of carbon dioxide poisoning. Oh, Mr Lombardi's got the information. 1986. Oh, you are good. You are good. Thank you, sir. 1980. It's always everything happened in the 80s. 80s. Oh, the 80s were good. Oh, good for me. Actually, oh, that weren't bad for me. <laughs> I was a teen. I was a teen in the 80s. That's right. Yep, absolutely. Um, oh, actually, Mr. Lombardi's given me this, and we've actually it's it's called. This is interesting. I would call it a fumarolic, but just looking here, and I know we don't always rely on Wikipedia. We've got a limnitic. Limnic eruption. I haven't heard of that term before, but I'm not going to discard it. Um, there might be something to that, and certainly might be worth something to read there um, for you. Um, all right, so the gases that volcanoes release, and I guess what makes some volcanoes deadly is not necessarily the act of lava or the act of um, explosions or volcanic bombs, but sometimes they can release gases that cause the death of many people. Sometimes gases are released on volcanoes in these small things called cinder cones, which are little, um, I guess, little pimples where gas and tephra and other small bits of rock will fly out of the volcano. Um, and they are also a type of fumarolic eruption. All right then. Um, before I do, I want to go back. I just want to talk about sulfur dioxide, SO2, very quickly. And what happens when it's released into the atmosphere? Sulfur dioxide, SO2, gets released by a volcano. Okay, let's just draw a volcano here. And there's our SO2. So that SO2 is then hit with ultraviolet light from the sun, UV radiation. It also mixes with water in the atmosphere. So water in the atmosphere and sunlight hits our sulfur dioxide and water particles. It then creates something called 
sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Now sulfuric acid actually cools the atmosphere. So I know some people were saying, well, climate change, we can blame it on volcanoes, but actually volcanoes do the opposite. Volcanoes can cool the atmosphere, mainly in the formation of this material. It's in the formation that it uses up latent heat to actually cool the atmosphere, but volcanic eruptions have been proven to reduce the amount of temperature locally um, and globally um, around the same time as the eruptions. What else from a volcanic eruption, Alia, I'm going to ask you, might cool the earth? Um, the clouds of ash. Perfect answer. Yep. Those clouds of ash will actually block the sunlight and stop, and, and, and that can actually work to reduce the, um, the temperature as well, the atmosphere. Okay, kids, that is the end of gas. Our next little lesson will be on paroxysmal activity. That's a violent volcanic activity. And I will put that one up as soon as I can, hopefully by tomorrow. Thanks guys, see you soon.